There comes a time in every person's life when you realise it's not about doing what you are told, but doing what you know is right for you. Let us take a journey of learning and discovery with the world's most successful people who are living the life of their dreams, walking through life using their inner wisdom and being of service to others. Forget exams, grades and test scores. What is your purpose? As we let go of what we think should be and learn from our elders to gain knowledge, inspiration and a true sense of who we are. What are your dreams? Does your life have meaning? Are you living a life of significance? Let's talk with today's guest. Hello and welcome as we spend some more time together on the Learning on Fire podcast. Today I'm talking to Steve Stewart. Hi Steve, thanks for joining me and let's explore the journey of who you are. Thanks Mark, I appreciate you having me on. Well, as you said, my name's Steve. It's always been Steve. I have never changed my name. It's been Steve, technically Steven, but we're not going to go down that road. That's, that's <laughs> a really long one. We don't need to go there. Uh, it, I've surprisingly found myself in a career of editing podcasts for people. It's something that didn't exist, obviously, when I was in high school or even when I was you know, in college uh, for a couple uh, classes I was taking. So I'm sure we're going to get into that in the story, but uh, live in St. Louis, Missouri in the Midwest of the United States and have my wife and uh, daughter who just turned 18 the other day. So wow. life is really starting to change around here. Yeah, it was really interesting. I, I did an interview um, a few weeks ago and, and, and the person was on there, Mark Green it was, was, was just saying about how he still sort of walks around his house now his children have left and has sort of a, a little sort of quiet moment with himself uh, that sort of once they've actually moved out and you spend all this time and you nurture them and then all of a sudden you're just, you're there on your own and I'm sort of, our eldest is 17 and I'm already starting to just uh, start, start have a few moments about that. <laughs> Well, I'd like to have that, but uh, the dog is really more troublesome than my daughter. So, <laughs> <laughs> great stuff. Um, so, let's talk a little bit about um, exactly where you are now and how it's different as you were as you were growing up. So, so what does your life look now in terms of your sort of day to day and your sort of the way your sort of weeks and, and and your months sort of get put together? And how is that different from when you when you were growing up and your experiences then? Well, my life today is, is pretty amazing. I get to work from home. I mean, my commute to the basement is really like three minutes most, and that's if I stop and get a drink of water on the way. Uh, in 2016, I started editing a podcast for a couple of financial bloggers that were well-known, and we launched that thing. There were other people in that, that community that heard about it, and within six months, I had so many people coming to me saying, Steve, we know you, we like you, we trust you. Would you edit our show? That it became It just overpowered everything I was doing. I had a, a, a side job or a side hustle that I was trying to make my career you know, as a financial coach. For a decade, I worked on that thing. I had to let that all go. And now it's amazing. I mean, that I can make a, a good living editing podcasts for people. Uh, that's where I am today. So what is it like? Why is it different than when I was growing up? I mean, this is something that could never exist back then. Uh, you know, the Internet wasn't around when I was growing up. Uh, or it, The very basics of it was, I guess I should say. Uh, but not something that every person in America could have their own computer like they do today. And of course, now we're walking around with them in our pockets. So the the you know technology is there, and then this medium called podcasting, which has only been around for a little more than a dozen years. I mean, now I get to serve people who have their own, you know, pseudo radio stations that people can consume on their smartphones, in their cars, while they're walking dogs. You know, we had Sony Walkmans when I was growing up, the cassette player that you would you know, put on your pocket or, you know, attached to a, a belt or something. That's amazing what you do now with Bluetooth ear pods and, and stuff like that. So it's, I mean, technology has completely changed the landscape to where I'm able to do something I could never have imagined was possible when I was growing up. And it really makes a, a difference, doesn't it? When you sort of talk to, I mean, I, when I talk to my, my dad about these things, I mean, he was a, a car mechanic. I mean, he's now retired, but that kind of going to do something to fix something to have a, a nine to five. And he had his own business, so he had a certain amount of flexibility in terms of what he did and didn't want to do, and things that he would take on and things he wouldn't. But like you say, that being working from home and, and the fact that there's a real kind of blur between what your working day is and your your actual home life is and you can have to be diligent sometimes to make sure that works but at the same time it's nice yeah. to have that freedom and that flexibility to merge the two together absolutely yeah there's definitely a blend of personal life with my career now but it actually works really well because I get to decide my schedule and like tonight we have to go to a meeting for my daughter 
So we're going to, you know, I'm going to shut everything down here, even though I might come back and work a little bit later tonight. You know, I'm shut it down because that takes priority over everything else I do. So I can work as hard as I want during the day and even in the margins of time around my life because I can just walk down to the basement and get a little bit more work done. And then also, you know, gives me the opportunity to earn more money because the more work I can do in a smaller period of time, the more profitable I can be, the more people I can help. Yeah, it's just, it's just amazing. And you talked a little bit before about having um, sort of financial coaching and that kind of thing. Can you give us a bit more of a background about some of the sort of previous sort of um, um, earning experiences you have or sort of um, work experiences? Okay, well, let's go back to uh, not high school, but after high school. Well, I guess you could say high school. Started working in a record store. It was always my dream to work in a record store. I mean, who's who doesn't like to do that? Of course, record stores don't really exist now. But back then it was like, that'd be a really cool job, right? So I was working in music retail and worked up, my, worked my way up through management there and eventually found a position in the company as an internal auditor. So I started doing a lot of traveling for them. And that was about the same time when the whole, uh, what do you call it? You know, everybody started to download their files, some illegally and some legally through the internet. And it really started to take a bite into music retail. And then you had the loss leaders like Target and Best Buy getting into the game of selling CDs at a loss, and it really started to kill the whole music retail chain. I started to look around and found a job for a company that it was kind of the same type of work as an internal auditor. Unfortunately, it kept me on the road a lot, just like the other job. Uh, at that time, I uh, had met my, my now wife. Uh, we moved to, uh, we both moved in the St. Louis area. That was when I was courting her. And uh, so I was an internal auditor for the first uh well, about 20 years, almost 20 years from the time just before I met my current wife to when I left that job. So I have that background in me. Lots of travel. And while I was traveling, I bumped into this thing called podcasting because I heard it uh, talked about on uh, the Dave Ramsey show, which I had just bumped to on, on, the, you know, on the radio when you're flipping dials and you're trying to find something to listen to. And he was talking at one point about how he had a podcast. I'm like, what's that? And I also heard Leo Laporte on the screensavers talking about a podcast. So I started listening to, to podcasts on the drive because they're so much better than radio. Uh, you can play your own music playlist, but it's pretty much the same songs over and over again. Uh, and if you listen to talk radio, it'll just drive you crazy sometimes. <laughs> so uh, that was really how I got into the scene of podcasting and, and uh, the, the work background, I guess you'd say. Uh, if you want to hear about the transition to podcast editing, I can fill that blank in a little bit better. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be great. As I was traveling a lot and I was doing the auditing uh, for that company and traveling a lot uh, and, and learn more about podcasting, I was also you know, a big fan of Dave Ramsey's. As, as I mentioned before, I bumped into him on the radio and just loved his stuff and he totally changed my life. I'm sure we'll talk about that in a little bit. And I really felt the calling to try and also teach other people how to manage their money better. My wife and I were okay with money and there was a time when something happened and it just slapped me in the face and said, we got to do better with money. And we finally just went all in on the whole get out of debt and save money thing. And I felt that was a calling then to, to be able to start teaching others as well. So I, I started a little uh, financial coaching business just in my community. And a few years later, in 2010, I actually launched, uh, I actually launched a podcast called Money Plan SOS, which was then my podcast about saving money beating off debt, building wealth, investing, not really that much investing, but just the whole, the whole thing. My, my comment or my tagline was pay attention, not interest. And that kind of tells you everything you need to know about the show. Yeah, I mean, that sounds really interesting. So, so I was just going to try to interrupt you there. I was just thought, um, especially for people listening who are, especially if they're thinking about going to university or college or, or how everything's sort of built around that kind of you have to be in debt in order to sort of get your life going. So I'd be just interested there just to delve a bit deeper into into your thoughts on that and, and how, especially for the younger people, how, how just thinking about it differently might really help them. Yeah, well, you don't have to get into debt to start your life off. There's always alternatives. Now, sometimes that means delaying things. Sometimes that means you got to work for things. Uh, sometimes that means you do get help from family, but it's not debt. It's a gift. There's always alternatives. It's just are you willing to sacrifice for the alternatives or is, are you going to just take the easy way out and, oh, I can just sign for this debt. I'll pay it off later. That's what we did. We signed for the debt and paid off later. And we're not doing that anymore. We've learned that debt's just not the way to go for anything, not – cars not college not a house even and that really is it's quite a mind um 
quite a mind shift for lots of people I would imagine just that kind of I'm actually going to start with actually having the money before I'm then going to spend it and I think certainly from for my generation I think certainly coming through having been through college and I, I managed to pay a lot of my way through just because as a musician I was sort of gigging as I was sort of getting through but I know lots of other people were just really struggling and we were still around able to have um, college grants and that sort of thing for university back then but certainly now when you're paying for everything up front it, it really is a it can be a minefield. Yeah if you think about what my daughter has available to her now I mean there's no way we would have known how much college is going to cost for her because she wasn't even sure where she was going to go. She got fantastic grades in the state of Missouri where we live. They have a program called the A-plus program. They will actually pay for her first two years of college at a community college, which there's one 10, 10 minutes from our house. There's no way we would have known that starting out freshman. Or, you know, And you start saving for someone in freshman year, you're not going to have enough money to send them to college. So <laughs> you know, this is something that if you're going to pay for your kid's college, you got to think way ahead. And then if you are not going to pay for your kid's college, they've got to find a way to do it. Well, you can get scholarships. You can get grants. That's hard work, getting those grants and scholarships. You can find a way. You can work your way through. I, I know lots of stories of people who have paid their way through college. They just have to make decisions based on what could they afford, what kind of education. And uh, I won't go into it, but there was a study that was just done in a book released from uh, Chris Hogan uh, called Everyday Millionaires. And there's a lot of statistics in there that show that some of these millionaires, they studied 10,000 millionaires, and a lot of these millionaires did not graduate from a private public or a private college school, and some of them didn't even graduate high school. It's crazy to think that they didn't, and you know how many didn't actually graduate college either. But they're millionaires, so you know you don't necessarily have to have a college degree. Of course, it's not a bad idea, and I definitely think you should go and try for a college degree. But it doesn't mean that you're a failure and that the world isn't going to work out for you if you don't get a college degree. And I think that sort of traditional route is beginning to change somewhat, isn't it? And, and as you've demonstrated from the conversation so far, you know, your career can change in so many different ways. And even more likely as we get into the, the, the next sort of decade or two is the fact that the jobs that we may well be doing, we wouldn't have even known two decades ago. So it's actually having that idea that anything could happen and just really just sort of allowing yourself to be guided in whichever way that happens to come to you. That's exactly right. I mean, look at what I'm doing now. I'm a podcast editor. Th this did not exist. Ten years ago, this did not exist as a career for anybody. I don't think anybody was making a living on podcast production. Now, there are people who are doing audio engineering and working for radio stations and all this other stuff, but not just podcasts. That's all I do is edit podcasts. This didn't exist 10 years ago. There's no college for this. There's education. There's online tutorials. There's classes like Chris Curran has a class called Podcast Engineering School. Uh, there's ways I, I taught myself basically what's, what I'm doing now. How do I make a living out of something that didn't exist and there's no, there's no formal college degree for? You just do it. I mean, I can't explain it much more than that. You just do it. And, of course, you've got to be able to work with clients and, and deliver something that they want. Great customer service, of course, is, is really important. But it didn't involve a college degree at all. I didn't get any kind of an audio engineering degree or, or even education. I didn't work for a radio station or television. I was a DJ for three decades, mobile and nightclub. So maybe that helped a little bit, but not really. I mean, there's no editing in live DJing. So... <laughs> <laughs> And, and that just goes to show, doesn't it, you know, the things that you're learning in school now, it's probably not the actual content so much that's going to help you. It's actually some of those skills in terms of working together and actually knowing what it's like to, to know how to learn that makes a big difference. And I suppose that takes us nicely on to um, what was valuable about your school experience. I didn't have a very fantastic school experience. I think I guess you'd call me like a C-plus student. Um, I really wasn't great at school. Uh, you know, that's where you went and you... You, you learned some things and you had conversation with your friends and you got through the day and you waited for summer vacation, right? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much. But if I, yeah, <laughs> if, if I look back now at what I should have done when I was there, is I should have learned how to learn. And I don't know how to explain that any better other than just saying I needed to learn how to learn. My brain doesn't process stuff as well as I want it to. Somebody will say something and it'll be the day later. I'll say, oh, I should have said or I should have responded or I should have answered a different way. You know, so I got to learn how to learn and how to interpret and process things so that I can then generate the correct answer, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So 
really there was really nothing spectacular about my school as far as education wise or what I was going through and no traumatic experiences, I guess you'd say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, guess, I guess that could be true for lots of people, isn't it? You know, it's it's a little bit like sort of the slight edge kind of um, idea that actually, if you just go, you just do what you need to do, and and you just take the advice that you have, and you just go through. Then you do sometimes just come out the other end, and and that's all you actually needed. It doesn't need to be light bulb moments, or you don't need to have failed and then come back or anything like that. Just turn up that's what you have to do you, and certainly these days you know you still have to go to school in, in whichever form that that takes you and just do as you're told do your homework do, do whatever it needs to be I mean I guess absolutely question everything and sort of be your own person but actually just doing what you need to do day in day out actually gets you through those years and actually gives you the qualifications you will need just to sort of flourish once you then have that freedom um, beyond that sort of containment of school. And I, I can't speak for what education is like today other than what I see my daughter go through. But we're in a suburb of St. Louis. It's not like we have a really dramatic type of school environment out here. It's not inner city and it's not uh, super private public. So anyway, that's just for my experiences. Yeah. Um, which teachers do you remember and, and why do you remember them? I guess I remember quite a few of them, but not – again, if I didn't have a dramatic education like in high school. And, and I should say I didn't take a full college I didn't go for a full college degree. I took some college courses, but I never took college. So everything I'm talking about is elementary, you know, mil, uh, middle elementary school, high school, stuff like that. I can remember a couple specifically because they had such an impact on my life. Was uh, One was Mr. Nelson. He was a science teacher, but he was a devout Christian. And sometimes people think it's kind of an oxymoron. How could you be a science teacher but also be a devout Christian? But uh, he, he was able to kind of slide in some of the things that I also believe. In, in my religion of Christianity uh, as a science teacher. It was pretty interesting how he got to be uh, that influential in that way. And I, I had a math te- This is kind of a, a funny haha remembering uh, memory. Uh, I remember a teacher. I just can't remember his name, but he was a math teacher. And um, he would give people nicknames every once in a while. And he, he, call- <laughs> and he called me Stubone. And one, it just, one time he said, hey, Stubone, and, and just kind of stuck. And people, it wasn't something that people made fun of me about. It was just one of those nicknames that kind of stuck. And I had a couple of nicknames in high school, but that was one that was just kind of funny. And, you know, I don't know why that one just kind of stuck. I guess sometimes it just gives you it gives you an identity which comes from somewhere which, like you say, just sticks with people and, and, and then I don't know, gives, gives you a feeling that you don't get in any other way. And I also, I like those stories about the fact that there are teachers that you gain something from which have nothing to do necessarily with the subject or or even that school particularly but there's just something about them like I say whether it's a religious um, idea or a way that they are or something like that which it, you, you can get these influences in so many different ways it doesn't have to be in that sort of traditional route I guess. Yeah it's better that a teacher gives you a nickname than the bully at high school I guess. I think that's very <laughs> true <laughs> especially if you're actually going to, are going to have to live with it for the rest of your school time that's for certain. <laughs> So who did you admire when you were young, and what was it about that person that had an impact on you? Oh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't really have anybody that sticks out in my mind as far as who I admire. I admire a lot of people. You know, of course, I respect my parents, love them to death. However, I will go into this story. This is going to be a nice side story for you. When I was in high school and my best friend came to – there's a longer story I'm going to go into. I'm going to just skip right to it. My friend and I and a couple other buddies from high school started a breakdancing group. I was the DJ – uh, my best friend was a leader. We had a couple other guys who had, you know, I guess you'd say specialties. And so we were really into the hip hop scene early, early on. This is pre Tupac, folks. This is real <laughs> hip hop from the beginning, okay? This is even before Run DMC got big, okay? And so we were getting into the breakdancing scene with hip hop and, you know, DJing and beatboxing and all this stuff. It was fantastic. Uh, there was a guy who, when. For people who know the song by Herbie Hancock called Rocket, there's a guy in there who does scratching. It was one of the first songs that hit radio that had scratching in it. And that was stuff that my buddies and I were just like, yay, finally on the radio. People are getting it. Scratching, you know. And the guy's name was Grandmaster DST. He was the guy who did the scratching for Herbie Hancock on that record and a few other records that Herbie Hancock did as well. And so I guess you'd say since I was a DJ and I was getting into scratching and hot mixing and stuff like that. He was somebody I guess I'd, I'd look up to and admire because he was one of the people that brought this skill set to 
you know, to music, the not the art of music, but the performance of music. And now you get to hear scratching and everything. It's in McDonald's and Walmart commercials. I mean, for crying out loud, you can't get through a commercial break without hearing some kind of a scratch sound. I dare you to sit through a commercial break, unless you're on like Lifetime or Hallmark Channel, that maybe they don't have those types of commercials. But you just listen to any commercial break, especially if it's like a kid's station. There's going to be a scratch sound somewhere in there. I promise you. That's definitely going to give me something to think about next time I'm sat in front of the telly, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. So Grand Mixer DST was the guy that we looked up to, I guess you'd say, because he did influence the the performance of music with a new instrument called a turntable. And that was something that had never really been mainstream before. And I guess that kind of that performance element thing, I guess, is something. Can you can you identify that a little bit now from sort of doing the editing and sort of hearing people and and that sort of podcasting side? Do you think that's given you a little bit of an edge or a little bit of understanding which you you sort of you sort of learnt in those early days from a sort of slightly different angle? I would say yes from the hot mixing scene. Scratching is one thing because that's actually just putting sound to a piece of music, but when you're hot mixing, you're mixing records together. You're trying to continue not the song, but you're con- continuing a whole string of music together in one piece. And it's not just the radio DJ who plays a song and then the next record starts. And, next, you know, we're actually mixing beats one over the other to transition from one song to the next without ever, you know, stopping. And it's the same, most of the time it's the same uh, tempo and everything. Uh, with that, I did learn that sometimes if you interject a sound that's kind of a, I don't want to say a sharp sound, but something that's a, you know, it's like, bam, it just hits you. Or you get into this movement where it's kind of mellowing out and it slows down. It brings the mood down a little bit and you kind of build up to a crescendo again. In podcasting, you can do things like that as well. When you think about a really great interview and they they start to talk about something really personal in their life and they slow down and it's getting emotional, you can hear it in the silence of their voice, kind of like what I'm doing right now. That's kind of like mellowing out that music and getting to that point. And then you start to talk about, you know, the, 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 the win or where it took you today. And it's like, okay, now we're getting into the good stuff. And even in speaking in a podcast, you can kind of get that movement, which is kind of like how music really good music is. Then there's things in, the production of a full episode where you've got to have those transition pieces, that moments from introducing the show to introducing your guest to now you've got your interview and maybe you go to a commercial break or something like that. Well, you can't just stop and say, Hey, we're going to take a break now and talk about, you know, blue apron. I guess you could, but it's not as great as if you had some kind of a transition with music, just a small piece of royalty free music, folks, royalty free. Mm -hmm. Remember that. (laughs) <laughs> or even a sound effect. Uh, I'll give you a little story. This is kind of unusual, but it might just demonstrate what I'm trying to explain here better. In the episode that Stacking Benjamins released on January 14th, uh, the theme was, there was a theme for the day. It was acapella day. Now, you have to listen to Stacking Benjamins to understand really what this is all about, but uh, I, I edit and produce the show for Stacking Benjamins. And this is the first time we ever did a show where there was absolutely no music, none. So how do you transition out of the introduction of the show into the headlines, into the interview, into the trivia, into, I mean, there's like 18 moving parts and pieces to the show. It's really amazing. You got to check it out sometime. Not this specific episode, but any episode is great, but there's always transition pieces. Well, how do you do that? Well, I interjected little sound effects at certain points just so that the listener would kind of identify that, oh, we're, tr- we're transitioning, we're changing to something different now. Otherwise, it would really just seem weird. One of the sound effects was a uh, like a studio mic sound. Uh, you know, if you click a switch, like you're, you're speaking to somebody in a recording booth, that's, that's what I envision when I hear the sound. And that's how we transitioned out of the interview into Doug's Trivia. Again, you got to listen to the show to understand what I mean by that. But just interjecting these little pieces of sound at the right times can just it, – it just makes the story. It's like you're turning a page. You're moving on to the next thing. It just helps the helps the progression of the show go along. 
Yeah, no, I can, I can really see that, and 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 also I've done it a couple of times in, in some of my podcasts, and it is just like I say, it's just a way of just being able to sort of separate things out in in a really subtle way sometimes. But it's amazing what the what the brain does, doesn't it, from a listening point of view, in terms of just sort of clicking into that and understanding how it is without the explanation even being needed. You'll hear that uh, whoosh sound, or you'll hear that scratch. You'll hear that scratch. I mean, and there's a couple of shows I produce that we use a record scratch. It, that's the sound. We're going. To the next scene or a bell uh one of my one of my clients does uh takeaways at the end of her episode she'll say takeaway number one ding okay there you go it just made the show so much more uh rich you know this experience of listening to her show rich because there's just this little sound we add to indicate the next thing and for anyone listening who wants to check some of these things out, because they're, 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 it's great advice, but also in terms of just understanding the way these things work and how you might even develop it into anything that you're doing, whether it's some storytelling or, or recording or editing or music or anything like that, um, all these links are going to be on our on the show notes. So if you go to educationonfire.com and just put Steve Stewart in the search bar, the show notes will come up. So we'll have links to all these things so people can just easily be able to check these things out and, and hear these things for themselves. Yes, and that's Stuart as in Stu Bone, (laughs) S-T-E-W-A-R-T. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Um, What was the best piece of advice you've ever been given, and who gave it to you? I'm glad you prepped me on this, because, of course, there's lots of great pieces of advice. But the best piece of advice was from Dave Ramsey. You know, he's very well known for, you know, saying things like, live unless you make. Totally makes sense. He's not the first to ever say that either. But I remember one time listening to him. He was getting on one of his rants. This is early on. This is, I mean, his rants are still great, but he was talking about get out of debt, do what you can, sacrifice, get out. And and he said this one line and it stuck with me forever. It says, you work too hard to be this broke. You work too hard to be this broke. And he said it in such a way, it just, it just rocked me to my core. And ever since then, I mean, that was one of those moments where it's like, gosh, darn it, I should be doing better with our money. My wife and I should be doing better with our money. We should be better than this. And that was kind of the the time when we made that decision. In 2006, we decided that's it. We're paying off the car loan. That was our last debt. We paid it off in one year. After that, we have not borrowed a penny, not for anything. I don't have any credit cards, nothing. I mean, that's pretty dramatic when you think about it. So that would be my best piece of advice that's ever been given to me. And what advice would you give your younger self now? I would say now it's to save more in our 401k. I know that sounds kind of ridiculous and kind of wishful. I started investing in, for the company I used to work for, uh, the company I used to work for, most people would recognize as either Sound Warehouse or Blockbuster Music. Blockbuster Music, the the company Blockbuster, if you remember them, bought Sound Warehouse. But anyway, I was working for that company there and, I started investing in the 401k maybe when I was 20, 21. I can't remember exactly when. And before I left that company about eight, nine years later, uh, it had grown to about $18,000. That's not much, but it was a good start. And I bet now if I were to look to see what that's worth now, which is about, gosh, I probably have to do the math here. How many more years is that? Uh, but 20-something years later. I would estimate if I was if I was able to keep that account separate and just let it keep growing – I'm sure it would easily be, without adding another dollar to it, easily be another $100,000 at least. Had I started investing even more in a 401k at work, I'm sure it'd be even more than that. Um, Fortunately, that lesson wasn't lost. Uh, My wife and I do still save into retirement accounts. And we do have a, we'll say a nice net worth. Take out the house value, and we're not millionaires yet, but we're very close. So uh, it's an easy way to, I can't say easy. It's a simple way to build wealth because most people have access to a 401k at their work. If they don't, they can do something called a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA. There's other things you can do if you've got businesses. I won't go into it here because this isn't the place for it. But a company-sponsored 401k plan makes it easy to save money and invest because they pretty much set everything up for you. You just have to decide how much is going to go into this, uh, this account every pay period and What investments inside of that account are you going to invest in? So it's an easy way to save money, grow money. And that's uh, one of the things, again, if we could talk about Chris Hogan's Everyday Millionaire's book, they found a lot of those 10,000 millionaires that they studied, a majority of them 
built their wealth from two ways. The, and the first way was 401k work. The second one was paying off their house early. And you, and you can see how the multiples of that start to really kick in, aren't they? Especially as, as you, like you say, if you're starting at such a young age, then, then it, it just grows and grows and grows and grows. And, um, and I mean, as you said, you, you've, got a, you've got a daughter of, of an age where you'd be starting to think about those sorts of things now. What, how, how do you sort of express that to someone who, who maybe isn't, that's not the first thing on their mind because of their age or, or because of, you know, they're thinking of spending more money now. They've got a bit more freedom, maybe, or they're starting to get a pay packet and they want to be using it all the time. How do you sort of sort of just guide them in that way to be supportive? Well, one of the ways would be to have them take a look at their financial situation as it is today. You know, take a seriously sit down, look and see what are your assets, what are your liabilities, how much is in savings, how much do you have in obligations every single month, how much of that is debt versus just the electric bill. You know, electric bill, cable bill, cell phone bill, those aren't debts. But car payments are, uh, credit cards are, you got to sit down. If you take a look at that, the answer is going to come to you. You're going to see that you work too hard to be this broke. So <laughs> <laughs> there needs to be some savings and investments there. And the less you have in debt, then the higher your net worth is going to be because the debt just erodes at your net worth. And so if you're going to try and spend all your money, uh Oh, Lord help you if you're looking at Social Security to pay for your retirement because that's just not going to work. And that's just in the United States. I don't even know what it is overseas, but definitely here in the United States, it's uh, you know, a lot of people looking at Social Security to be part of their retirement. And it's just a sad looking pittance of an income not to be relied on. Yeah, and I, I, oh, that's certainly the same here in the UK as well, and I'm sure sort of many places around the world. And I, I think the, the greatest piece of advice there was just that kind of actually being honest and sitting down and actually just crunching the numbers. And I'm sure there are many people listening who that's a, a, a almost like a foreign policy, really, in terms of actually knowing that you know you sort of you don't even look at it; you just take stuff out of the cash point, or you just spend it, like say, or you have your credit card, or however it happens to be. But to actually sit down and say, where are we with this? How much have I got? What do I owe? What's coming in? and actually just being really honest and straightforward sort of week on week, month on month. And I think just even contemplating that as an actual something you're going to do on a regular basis will just change the way that your financial life is anyway. Amen. So what does your future look like, do you think? I hate this question, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those, hey, what do you, where do you see yourself in five years? Well, who knows? I mean, 10 years ago, I would have never, ever, ever guessed I would have been editing podcasts for a living. There's no possible way you could have told me Hey, you'd be in 10 years, you'd be editing a podcast. I'd be saying, what's a podcast? You know, it's like that. Oh, uh, what does my future look like? I'll tell you what's really exciting to me right now. And it's, I'm going to sound boastful here. And I don't want to sound boastful because I really, I'm not that type of a guy. Just a little more than two years ago, I started a Facebook group for podcast editors. And I, I really did it because I wanted to hang out with other podcast editors. I'm like, hey, are there other people out there? I know there's a couple. Who else out there edits podcasts for other people? And I've opened the doors to anybody who edits podcasts, whether it's just for their own show or they do it for other people as well. The community has grown to almost 3,500 members in two years, which is just blows my mind. And because of this, I'm kind of seen as a subject matter expert, even though all I did was start the group. And I'm very active in there. I'm always encouraging people to get in conversations. We're learning from each other. And we're having fun in there too. So there's this, this desire – because now I've got this visibility and because I am actually, you know, making a living as a podcast editor is proof positive that I kind of know what I'm talking about, I guess you'd say, or I guess you'd say I'm an industry influencer. I can elevate the perception of what a podcast editor can provide to people. Cause I know when I was, I had a podcast from 2010 to 2015 and I was always producing my own show. Why would I pay somebody else to do it? Well, now I can see who needs a podcast editor, why they need a podcast editor. And the way that podcasting is growing now, there's a lot of people who are getting into podcasting who never want to know or need to know how to edit a single piece of audio. They can just outsource it to somebody. And there are people out there who want to do it for them. So I can get out there and I can provide, I don't want to say education, um, the perception that podcast editing is something that it's not just somebody you hire on out uh, on Upwork. It's not just somebody you outsource to on the Philippines to save a couple of bucks. A real podcast editor is going to charge you, you know, a hundred bucks an episode or more. And they're going to be a team member 
in your, uh, I work mostly with people who their podcast is really part of their business or their branding. It's important. It's not just a hobby. So podcast editors are going to provide a real value to those type of people who are using podcasts as, you know, a marketing arm of their business, something to get their name out there or to, to allow people to get to know who they are, what they provide, and maybe buy their book, their services, whatever it is. And I like that idea that it's actually being part of a team and actually being an integral part of everything that goes on. And I have to, um, in all my professional life, whether it's my, my professional musician um, life or my, my teaching life or, or even within the podcast community, that kind of feeling, a real sense of being part of a team, being part of a community, being part of a, a supportive network is actually where I feel most at home and where I actually want to be. And I think it's a fantastic service um, that you're providing and able to support others to do that. Yeah, exactly. If you look at some of the shows that I produce, uh, Stacking Benjamins, the guys, the show is one hour at least three days a week, at least an hour, three days a week. There is no way you can produce a show like that with production. I mean, this is not just a hit record and publish when you're done. This is a production of a show, which makes it stand out above a bunch of other podcasts. There's no way that this guy could do it himself. There's no way. And it's no way he could outsource it to somebody in the Philippines. You know how I know? Because he used to do it that way. And when something happened and things fell through, uh, Joe Salci, the main host of the Stack Benjamin show, reached out to me. He's like, Steve, I need you. You know, <laughs> it was just he was making it work. But then he's like, no, this is growing to be too big and too important. I need someone. Steve, I know you like like you trust you. And that's how I uh, get to start working for the Stack Benjamin show. That's fantastic, and then I, I think people will really be able to identify with that because just being integral to that, and I, and I think when when like I say when things start to go wrong or the chips are down, you look for people that you can trust, and those are the sorts of people you want to surround yourself with, and um and then you can grow. It's not just about cutting costs or or even saving time. It's about actually growing and producing the best thing that you can do, and and in terms of podcasting and editing, then like I say that 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 is sort of the holy, holy grail, really. Yep, and I never took a lesson. In podcast editing, <laughs> self-taught, never one lesson. <laughs> it is. I mean, when, when I, you know, I, I same thing for me. It was that kind of. I started listening to podcasts and thought, oh, I, I, yeah, I quite like the idea of doing this, and had no idea where to start or what to do. But like you say, you go out there, you find the community, you find courses, you find whatever it is that you can do, and bit by bit you teach yourself, and that sort of goes sort of full circle from that whole sort of school and education idea. It's about finding what you need when you want to do it and adapting as and when your life takes on those roles and um, I think if you can understand it for that then I think you're, you're able to do anything that you need when these opportunities arise. Yep. So just to bring it all to a conclusion what podcast, book, video, film, song or, or resource has had the biggest impact on your life and why was that? I guess I have to go back again to, to finding Dave Ramsey on the radio and then listening to his podcast and just consuming my life with that. Because he led me to other things, and, and this is probably the biggest one. You said what podcast, book, video, film, whatever. I'd say the book. Uh, this book is really – I reread it every year. And I actually bought a paperback copy because I wanted to highlight it and make notes in the margins. So I've got the audio book, and I've got the paperback, and it's The Millionaire Next Door by Thomas Stanley. Uh, this guy studied millionaires back in – the late 80s, early 90s, and published a book about how some of the millionaires are living next door to you, and you'd never know it. And here's what they did. Here's what they do. It's not the glitzy, glamorous person on TV. They didn't uh, win the lottery. Uh, they don't have high uh, seniority jobs. And this is a lot of the same stuff that Chris Hogan has in his book, Everyday Millionaires, that just came out, found a lot of the same things. It hasn't changed in 30 years. So that book, The Millionaire Next Door by Thomas Stanley, uh, so many, so many great things in there. And, you know, if you like that, you're probably going to like his daughter. His, his daughter was working with him before Dr. Stanley died, and she just released a book called The Next Millionaire Next Door. So she's continuing the legacy of studying, I, I guess you'd say, the behaviors of the rich and how they got there. And I mean, now there's there's a lot of great resources out there. So it started with me as the millionaire next door. But I think people would really get a kick out of either that uh, Sarah Falaz uh, book, The Next Millionaire Next Door or Chris Hogan's Everyday Millionaires. That's 
great for people listening who maybe haven't come across those things before. And as we said, they're all on the show notes, educationonfire.com. And then in the search bar, look for Steve Stewart with AW. Make sure you remember exactly how you're going to spell that one. <laughs> Stubon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, for those that have really enjoyed this, um, Steve, um, what's the best place for people to get in contact with you or find out a little bit more and, and just explore some more of your journey? You'll never guess. It's at stevestewart.me. <laughs> Perfect. Simple and sweet. stevestewart.me. I couldn't get the .com because the guy who owns that has had it for 20 years, 21 years now. Oh my gosh, I get, uh, I'm never going to get the .com. So it's stevestewart.me. That's where you can find everything about my past podcasts, uh, some of the work I'm doing today, how to reach out to me, uh, you know, just if you need me, just find me there, schedule an appointment if you want to talk. Fantastic. Thank you, Steve, for sharing your wisdom and allowing us to learn from your great experiences. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Learning on Fire podcast. For more information, please visit educationonfire.com and follow the links from the homepage. This show is sponsored by the National Association for Primary Education. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire.